Hello, um, here I am live uh, and I'm so excited to be here. Um, I made it on time. I've, I've had such a rush today, but I'm so happy that I made it on time. And if you have been anticipating um, listening and learning today, I'm happy that I'm not late. So... Um, like I said, if you have any questions, please just post them, uh, make a comment, you know, and I'll, I'll do my best to respond as well as I can. Um, so welcome to the Quilt Africa Fabrics presentation of Aquating Aure. The first part of our wooing, courting and marriage custom series in Africa. Um, so... I'll just take a little time to introduce myself um, for those who possibly will be tuning in for the first time or um, getting in contact with the page for the first time. And for those who have been here for a little while and haven't heard anything of me. So my name is Miriam Galadima Benson. I live in Abuja in Nigeria, which is at the central, at the heart of West Africa. You know, um, I started Quilt Africa Fabrics in 2017 for three big reasons. One, because I have a love for fabrics. I love bold fabrics. I love vibrant fabrics. I love African fabrics. I love African prints. You know, um, I've been known to just shop around and buy and keep. Sometimes... They're so pretty, I don't want to cut them up. I don't want to use them. Or I'm always waiting for that special project or that special dress that I want to make with my fabrics. I also started quilting as a hobby um, sometime in 2016. I loved, I loved going on Pinterest and just watching, you know, looking at pictures and pictures of beautiful quilts that um, quilters had made. You know, and one day I just bit the bullet. I got fabrics, cut them up with my scissors, and then I sewed them. It took me months because it was so tedious. I didn't have the equipment and, you know, some of the tools, like a mat or a rotary cutter or the rulers that make um, quilting so much easier. But because I really wanted to, I got the job done and and... That, that's one of the most satisfying things that I've done in my life, you know. And I also started Quilt Africa Fabrics because I know a lot about fabrics. When I, as a child, I've told this story before, but as a child, my mother left her job to stay with us kids. We were five. And she used to take me on her buying trips. She sold fabrics. We were in the, we lived, we moved from northern Nigeria to southern Nigeria. And if you know anything about the coming of the colonials, they landed in the southern parts of the southern coast of West Africa or the coastal regions of, of, of Africa, really, because of their ships. So the south had more contact or, you know, um, earlier exposure to to the Western world. So civilization and exposure came to those in the South before it got down to us who are from the North. So there were so many African fabrics. She used to buy lots of fabrics and take down to the North and that was her business, you know. So she took me on those buying trips to the famous um, fabric markets in Lagos and so she taught me about fabrics. She explained the qualities, the, you know, the, 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 the nuances of the designs, you know, so I know a lot about fabric. So it was only natural for me to actually start Quilt Africa Fabrics. So I'm married and I have three beautiful children who I now stay home for. You know, I stay home to take care of them and run the business um, while I'm at home. So I decided this year that I needed to 
speak more about the customs, the traditions, and the way of life of, in Africa. You know, because fabrics are such an integral part of our culture in Africa. Because our fabrics always tell a story. The fabrics are a reflection of, you know, the community, the culture, the people. So fabric, fabric me being a fabric seller in Africa, is not removed from the culture of Africa. You know, because fabrics and culture are, are so tied together. So I've been wanting to do this, but because of um, so many reasons, chiefly being the birth of my son, it just, um, you know, it was so too overwhelming. But now that he's older, this is the right time to begin to just share, to just share the customs, to share the, the traditions, to share the way of life. You know, and as someone pointed out, um, February is the best month because it's to start because it's Black History Month. So I'm hoping that my my sisters in in Af in America and around the world are getting in touch with their roots and they are falling in love with our culture. You know, that is the main reason why I'm I'm doing this and. Other quilters who do who love African fabrics but don't really know much about the culture, I'm hoping that you would learn a lot from it. So this series, the entire video series, which I hope to be running from now till the end of the year, is my attempt to bring my Africa to you. Is my attempt to to open up Africa in a way that you probably haven't um, experienced before. So now. Um, because it's also Valentine's Day, I decided to start with the marriage process, wooing, courting, marriage, how it happens in, in, in Africa. You know, it's, it's different from, from the Western way. It's different also from how it's being done these days. Because from the time I got married to now, there are differences. But one thing that remains constant is that all the traditional um, requirements have to be met. They just have to be met. There's no two ways about it. Because uh, tradition and culture is so strong here that anybody who doesn't fulfill the cultural and traditional requirements is not even regarded as someone who is married. For instance, if I had met... Um, my husband is from a different culture, a different part of Nigeria. Assuming while I was on my job, I met my husband and we decided, hey, we want to get married. Let's just go to the courts and do that. Once I get home, my family, my clan, my village, they're not going to acknowledge my husband because they're going to say they don't know who he is. He has not come to the elders. He has not come to your people to say this is who we want. So they're not going to acknowledge him as my husband. They're not going to acknowledge any children we have as a part of them. It's still such a strong tie that even if you elope, which is, like I said, very rare, you always have to come back and, and go through this traditional process. So it's always better to save yourself a whole lot of trouble and just do it the right way from the beginning. So you might be legally married in a court of law, but your, your people, your family, your extended family, your clan, your tribe, they will not accept the marriage until these um, cultural and traditional requirements are met. So essentially, um, this is the African marriage process. A boy and a girl meet. Either they find themselves or matchmaking aunties, cousins, friends, put them together. And they begin to see each other. You know, um, the dating process is not the way we see in the movies. You know, you, you meet, you go out for drinks. A lot of the times the dating process is the, the, the boy comes to the girl's house and they sit at the front of the house and they talk you know traditionally that's it or during festivals and cultural events 
that's when they get to meet. And, they, and the more they get to meet, the more the, 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 the bride or the girl is obligated to let her people know that this is what she is. In. She, she doesn't tell the parents immediately, but she tells aunties, she tells cousins. And then the next thing that happens is an investigation begins. Aunties, uncles begin to dig into the boy's history and vice versa, really. Vice versa. But it's a little bit more, um, more common with the bride's family because the girl leaves to go into the, the husband's... Um, she joins the husband's family, as it were. You know? So an investigation begins. You begin to find out whether they have any histories of mental illness, whether they've been marked by the gods, you know, whether someone in their lineage has, of, has committed an offense against the community or against the gods, you know, things like that, that um, investigations that will, will lead to any unsavory part of either family being found out, you know, and if something undesirable is discovered, then that courtship or that wooing stops right there. Because I remember before I got married, there were some people that were interested in me and um, it would go on and then I'd tell my mom and she'd say, ah, this family, no, 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 this, this, this and this. Ah, this family, this, this and this. So it's very, it's a very, it's a very serious thing. People don't want to be coupled with the bad eggs in the society. They don't want to be coupled with the bad seed in the society. So that investigation is very important. In some cultures, they go as far as div divining. They go to the priest and the priestess with gifts, kola nuts and chickens and y tubers of yam and oil and stuff like that. And they invoke the spirits of the ancestors to find out, to divine the fate of that marriage. If we allow our daughter, or if we allow our son to marry this person, what's their future going to be? Is it going to please the gods? Are the ancestors going to be happy or are they going to be sad? The next thing is the investigation is um, carried out and both parties are satisfied. It's time for an introduction. The groom with his father and maybe two uncles or so or fa close family friends take a trip to the, fem to the girl's house and they meet with the father in an informal, semi-informal setting, you know, they come in and they have a discussion. Oh, my son has found someone whom he wants to marry in your house. And the father asks questions, you know, and he calls the girl and he asks her, do you know this boy? Do you know what he wants? This is what he wants. What do you say about it? You know, some, and then the mother is called and maybe a few aunties, you know, and there's that sort of discussion, that sort of um, preliminary introduction, you know, in a semi-formal setting. You know, if the girl gives her consent that, yes, actually, I've been seeing him and um, this is what we want to do, then a date is set or they begin a series of um, communication between the girl's family and the boy's family. And then a second introduction is, um, is set. A second introductory date is set. The second introduction is, is very important because then a larger group of people are invited on both sides of the family, on the girl's family and on the boy's side of the family. More cousins, more uncles, more elders. You know, it's now a big thing. And there's the boy's family now come, they come with gifts. They come with gifts. They come with um, things like food items. They come with clothing. They come with whatever it is they think that will, you know, that, that will be a show of their, their desire to be married to the girl from that family. And the, the bride's family, on the other hand, they gather together and there's cooking for days before the introduction, planning, and their job is to feed the groom's family and whoever, whatever guest he comes with 
and their own guests, of course. So there's a lot of cooking, a lot of food, a lot of merriment. You know, some people come with traditional dancers, you know, so it's a big thing. And during that um, second introduction, that's the time where the bride price and the dowry and the list for traditional items are discussed. Uh, there's a breakaway group of the groom's family and the girl's family, and they just sit and they um, talk about it, you know, and they give him a list that he has to present on the traditional wedding day. Now, the last bit of the marriage process is the traditional ceremony where, you know, the groom comes with those items that were written in the list and a ceremony goes on. Um, the last part of this series is going to be the wedding or well before the month runs out we'll break down the marriage process and you get to hear um how it actually happens so that's when the elders come together and they pray for them and they talk you know they advise them and the dowry is paid and the bride price is given and gifts are given and all the other items that are required, uh, every other condition that the bride's family require from the groom is met. And these are some of the items that might be on the list. It changes from culture to culture. But for my culture, the biggest thing is sesame seeds. Sesame seeds are given, the bride buys bags of sesame seeds, which are ground into a paste and distributed so we do not have um traditionally we don't have wedding cards invitation cards the sesame seeds act as the invitation so you go and you see a lady and the discussion about her might be that oh her sesame seeds have been eaten the minute you say her sesame seeds have been eaten it means that she is already married because a traditional marriage in the African culture is as good as married. It's, in fact, it's, it's a marriage. So for anyone who has been traditionally married, to say they don't, it's like, it's like a divorce. You have to go back to the elders and to the, to the families and you have to undo what has been done. So anyone whose sesame seeds have been eaten um, is automatically married and Everyone is hands off. So the biggest thing for me, for my culture, is sesame seeds. But other cultures, you have tubers of yam, you have goats and chickens, you have palm wine, you have drinks, you have cola nuts, you have... And in my culture as well, a groom is required to work for a season, a farming season in the bride's family farm. This is to prove that he's a hardworking person, who understands because farming was the, the occupation of the day. So he had to go to the bride's family farm and work under the supervision of her father and, her, and the elders so they could see his and gauge his diligence. That's before they even say yes to the wedding. So um, if they come for the introduction, he has to do a farm service before the consent is given for the traditional marriage. So other th I, um, things are salt, the honey, um, tobacco, sugar, and each of these items represents certain things in the culture, you know. So the aquatic aure is also on the wedding list. The groom has to bring a suitcase filled with fabrics and clothing items to present to the, to the bride. Because those are the things that her, her whole manner of dressing has to change. You know, she goes from being a maiden into a married woman. So he brings her cl a clothing, fabrics, so she can make clothes that befit her, her new status as a missus. You know, so um, that's basically it about the wedding list. Now, I just want to talk a little bit more about the aquatic Aure. Aquatic array literally means wedding box. You know, like I said, the groom gives it to the bride to help her enter into her new role as a married woman. 
the aquatic array must include all the trendy fabrics, all the um, popular fabrics, all the trendy fabrics, and they come well. Of course, it depends on the buying power, the the wealth of the groom, but he doesn't go cheap. He goes as best as he can, and most times his family help. You know, his family have to pitch in. I remember when my brothers got married, the whole, um, my elder brother got married, all of us had to pitch in and we had to build the aquatic hour. We had to build up the box. We had to make sure there's always a list. You have to make sure you have so-so number of wrappers, so-so number of laces, so-so number of brands. You have to buy high quality brands. You have to buy the low, lower quality ones. You know, you, you just mix it up and you make it as, awesome as you possibly can you know you might put in sh um in another box there would be shoes and bags and another maybe a beauty case there'll be jewelry gold and stuff like that so it's a very serious thing it means that the bride goes in to her husband's house ready to represent and kind of like dress like me she usually has to have head covering because she's now married she can't leave her hair free and she wears modest things with sleeves like i'm wearing you know and this is like a long dress all the way it's a kaftan it goes all the way down so typically that's how a married woman dresses but of course with the um, westernization the influence of american movies we dress a whole lot different these days but traditionally this is what would have been expected of us um the groom's family, like I said, they have to put their best foot forward because a poorly presented aquatic aure will be rejected as well as any other item on the list. If the bride's family deem it that the, the groom's family just did a shoddy job, a rush job, they stand well within their right to reject it and say, look, it's like you're not taking our daughter seriously. She's not just anyone. She's precious to us. So you can't just do things anyhow. Go back, take this, go back and, and um, do, I mean, do a better job or the wedding is off. It gets as serious as that. I think I remember a cousin of mine when I was much younger, they didn't do a good job with the wedding box. So it was sent back and the wedding was postponed. And like I, gave, like I was saying in the introduction earlier on, the wedding can be postponed. The aquatic hour in my culture is brought a night or two before the white wedding, where the, the bride's house is abuzz with preparation. You know, there's a lot of frying of meat. There's lots of just so much. You make pastries, you make snacks. There's preparation for food, for all the favorite foods, for all the traditional foods. So like a week before the wedding, the, the bride's house begins to fill up with relations. They come from all over, all over the villages, you know, other family compounds. They come in and they stay in the bride's home and the groom as well, you know, for, because for both my sister, myself and my brothers, that's exactly what happened. Um, family coming from all around. And there's a lot of cooking, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of excitement, you know. And presenting the aquatic array is really exciting because the groom comes to the gate or the outer door of the bride's compound. And there are protocols that they have to observe. They don't just walk in with the box and drop it and no. They come in, they knock and they have to pay to enter, you know. They bring the box and they have to pay for it to be opened. They pay for it to be opened and they have to pay for it to be inspected, you know. And right there and then, some of the tough aunties are the ones who do this, who have the job of checking out the, the, the aquatic aure. They can say, no, 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 this fabric does not look like it will look good on our daughter. So please pay up. If you can't choose, we get to choose for you. So there's a lot of money that is extorted from the, groom, from the groom and his friends and his family. You know, it's just a fun kind of thing. And sometimes they beg. They beg and beg and beg. Oh, please, we've spent so much already on this um, box. So it's just a time to, 
to kind of like cut the groom down to size because the African culture is very patriarchal. It's a family, it's a man dominated culture. So this is the only time that the women get to one up the men, you know, when it comes to the aquatic area. So it's always very exciting. You see all the female cousins and all the female aunties, they gather around, you know, and everybody wants to peek, you know, and see what it is that the new bride is getting. So it's always very exciting. I remember when I was a girl, especially for my cousins, my older cousins that got married, it was always so exciting. And then when it got to my turn and my sister's turn, you know, it was a whole lot less exciting because I was much older. So, and I'd seen quite a bit of it, you know. Um, in other cultures, the Aquatic Ari is presented in, uh, at other times. It's not always on the, a few days to the white wedding, the church wedding. So in some cultures, it's presented during the, during the traditional wedding proper. It comes with all the tubers of yam and all the other requirements that's, that need to be given. So... Um, basically that's it on Aquatic Aure, you know, it's just, um, I just decided to pick on it because it had to do with fabrics and I know that we're all fabric lovers here. So I just wanted to kick that off with it. Um, the next time it's going to be on something different, but that is critical to the, the wedding, the wedding process, you know, and so um, as we go along, I'll give you snippets about what's going to happen. I don't want to give all out right now, but I promise you that it's going to be something that um, involves almost all the cultures in Africa. You know, like I said, Aquatic Aure is called different things by the culture, depending on the language. Aquatic Aure is in Hausa language. It's just Aquati means box. Aure means marriage so it literally means box of marriage when you add an n to the aquati aquating aure then you have box for wedding or box of wedding so that's basically what it is um so i just want to thank you for tuning in and stopping by i hope that um even if you're watching on replay you pick out something and like I said, if you have possibly done a DNA testing and you know what tribe you come from, you can send me a comment and then I will um, be sure to dig in and answer and give you the details of what you would like to know about your culture. And um, if there's any other question that you'd like, to, you'd like me to, to answer... I'll be very happy to do that. I get excited when I, when, when I see questions because it means that you are with me and you're supporting me. So th that, that, really, that really, really excites me. So today I did a better job of tying my headgear. I'm not the best headgear tire, <laughs> but today I think I did a better job. This is typically how a northern woman would um, step out um out of her house with her head covered and her sleeves covered her hands covered with longer sleeves and a full dress so i hope that you enjoyed my 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 presentation i had actually prepared a pdf to um to show you pictures i i actually did but we haven't had power for We've last week we 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 had a blackout for like two or three days, and power has been gone since morning, and everything the Wi-Fi everything has just died out. So we're hoping that um, power comes back so I can so I'll I'll probably just post it in the group or in the on the page for a little while so you can just browse through and see what it is that you like. Um, I also want to ask that you please stop by the store and um, check out what you would like. And if there's something special that you would want, just send me a message and I'll be on it and I'll try and, you know, um, get to you. Like I said, we can always do a live. I'll be at the market. We'll do a live. Um, we'll do a live thing and I will, 
you get to make your choice and all I need to do is ship it to you. So a quick reminder that um, all mystery bundles ship for $8 to the US. I hope you take advantage of it. And um, don't forget to follow us on Pinterest, on Instagram, and of course on Facebook. Join the group. The group is now public. Woo! So you don't have to go through too much rigor to, to be a part of the group where we share a lot of this um, almost every day. So um, thank you so much for, for coming in and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.